Right, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back to another Lunchtime Live episode of um, Start Art History with me, Dr. Jay Hicks, here at Masterpiece 2022. And this afternoon, I have the singular pleasure of welcoming John Makepeace OBE uh, to have a chat about furniture, about design, value, and what inspires use. John, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm much obliged, actually. John and I were having a conversation uh, just before starting today about um, the pieces of furniture that we own and that we love and that we, we sort of uh, grow up and grow old <laughs> with. Um, so, John, if I could begin, let me ask, what inspired you to work with furniture as opposed to any other aspect of design or art? I think from early childhood, I found an affinity with timber. Hmm. Uh, and I'm trying to account for that, I remember some pieces of furniture we had in the house at home, uh, which were rather special, and I never quite knew why. And only as I asked about them did I realize they'd been made by my grandfather. Uh, and they were very fine quality, uh, but uh, retro reactionary in their design. Mm -hmm. um, so made probably at the turn of the 20th, turn of the 20th century. Uh, but, um, you know, this tactile quality, the visual quality, the grain. The, as a child of five, I could begin to appreciate. I, do, we, do you mind if I ask, do you know the wood that the uh, pieces were made from? Yes, uh, they were generally, generally mahogany, okay. um, probably Cuban. Mm -hmm. mm. Nice. And it ages beautifully. That, yes. <laughs> the, the grain on its absolutely perfect. And why I ask um, about it, just diving straight into, into wood is, of course, uh, you're best known, as I'm sure everyone knows, uh, for your designs, your furniture in wood. Wood is a passion of yours. Indeed. Um, what is it about wood that moves you, as opposed to any other material? Well, I don't think there is any other material that has <laughs> such huge variety. Mm. Uh, I love the fact that one's taking a piece of the landscape and turn it into something which we become very intimate with in our homes. So that sort of switch, and then the idea that we then look after trees for another generation. I love that whole cycle. As you know, conservation is, of course, a, a, a great interest of yours. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems, in some ways, it could, on the surface, seem counterintuitive, um, because, of course, wood is a material that you are using, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think in drawing attention to the longevity of that material, that, that wood is a product. Again, I don't want to name names of any major retailers that, <laughs> that are working in any other material, of course. But, um, you know, that, that thinking about the opposite of the idea of fast furniture or of disposable furniture of, of, of a thing that, that, that you, can, you can love and you can pass down or, or pass on, you know, to someone else, much like your own inspiration. Yes. I mean, certainly with the time and effort you put into making a piece of furniture, you're not thinking about it's having a short life. Mm. Uh, very often one's in, asked whether one would like to do pieces of furniture which are fitted to an interior. And I decline that. I mean, I'm really interested in those things which are freestanding, which become part of your life, hmm. which is much more the case with freestanding furniture right. than with things which are in the building, and then when you move, they may very well be torn out or changed. So my life is not about short-term prospects. <laughs> I, I, I love the idea of that, of, of thinking in, in, the long, in the long term. Again, as we were, we were chatting just before uh, we started today, that my favorite piece of furniture in, in my home is a, a restoration chair, a, a sort of later 17th century uh, single wooden chair that, that I, um, I bought for my wife for her birthday. And at some point over the centuries, the, the tall back has been scalloped out, a family crest presumably removed, and the legs shortened to the degree that the seat of the chair is 12 inches off the ground. Yes. It's effectively a children's chair. Yes, <laughs> you know, at yes, some point, yes. it would have been this, you know, this lovely thing. But but I I I, I engage with this 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 object every day with its its wooden nails and and wormwood holes and its rickety, <laughs> you know. Yes. And and yes. I think and one of the things that 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 strikes me about the object every time I I, I sit on it every day, um, that that I sit on it is I think like, good lord, there was someone sitting on this chair 
when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Yes, there was, there was yes, someone yes. sitting on this chair during you know, the Great Fire, you know, the, when, yes. the, when the, the blitz was happening. Someone's rear end was on this chair. Now my rear end is on this chair. That's nice. <laughs> yes, it compares for me with the fact we're using oak now, which was mm -hmm. planted in 1740, mm -hmm. harvested in 1980. And uh, when we were making furniture for Longleat House, mm -hmm. the owner, Lord Bath, said, um, no, we're harvesting some oak. I wonder if you'd be interested. Uh, and that harvested in 1980, and we're using it still today. So now it's 42 years since it was felled. So How was 240 that? years growing, and 42 years since. And, and um, really wonderful. Just trees which have had generations of foresters looking after those trees mm -hmm. and making them into wonderful statues to nature as it were. Absolutely. Now, what, what is it like working with wood of that age? How does that differ from working with wood that's of a more recent vintage? I'm not sure that the age of the growth is so significant than mm -hmm. the soil, because trees grow so differently in different situations. Uh, I would say it's very distinct from any other oak. Uh, I, I, in this country, we, we import a certain amount of French oak, uh, and, of course, too much American. Well, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, our English oak is, is distinct. Mm. It is so extraordinary. Um, uh, and, of course, what you're seeing, I mean, a tree which has been growing that long is probably going to be four to five feet in diameter mm. um, in an old measure. Mm. It's, it's, it's such a cool idea for me particularly in the 21st century when we, we think in terms of disposability, we think in terms of, 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 of chopping and changing, you know, um, that, that you're still relentlessly pursuing the idea of things that will last or things that will outlive us yes. in some way. But equally important to me is that change in structure. Now, the history of furniture is one of constant evolution. Mm. And... It seems to me so much furniture now is still being made, although well, being made by machine and, and obviously digitally, um, but the forms date back to the 17th century. Uh, and really what interests me is that now we have a whole different range of science mm. that enables us to make things differently. Uh, and of course in wood that's really important because how you connect things in wood is how long the furniture will last. Of course. And we now have new technologies which give us a far higher performance than was possible by those traditional means. Now, I was going to ask, actually, this is so interesting you bring this up, because in looking at your furniture, it, it, it is, um, I, I don't know if I necessarily want to use the word contemporary, but it's, it's, it's not strictly historically informed. It's not sort of Chippendale inspired, you know, any of, any of this. But, but what, how do you, how do you, how does the, the history of furniture design in England, which is a says rich tradition, I mean, really one of the great English art forms, mm -hmm. um, yes. you know, furniture design, uh, how does that inform, how, how did that inform your practice when you were starting out? Well, it certainly was where, where, <coughs> where I started, and of course one was very inspired, and I, I always loved the arts and crafts movement, which itself had very deep roots into tradition. Uh, but... Um, uh, it, it, it informed one's early work, but I think as you become more self-assured and more, I mean, I think you have to be a rebel anyway to be a designer. And, and so I, I've, I've really not wanted to make anything that could have been made in an earlier generation. Okay. No, because why would I? I mean, we are by nature not only makers, but we're thinkers. And if we're thinking, then I really want to apply that to creating new ways of solving classic problems and getting a better result. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the arts and crafts movement, and this is something that I, I wanted to bring up, actually, myself, so thank you so much, um, <laughs> is that William Morris famously reacts against um, factory production, um, what today we would call sort of CNC machine, you know, mm -hmm. production of identical pieces of furniture. Um, now, I know that handcrafting is a major part of your own practice, right. um, but do, do you work with, with machines much? We do, um, yes, and we do a certain amount of digital, digital work too, in mm -hmm. terms of um, certain processes we can um, use, digital cutting. 
Uh, it's not an easy route, but it's, I feel it's there, therefore I should be exploring. How does one find a language for this new technology? Because it's extensively used to copy old design. Of course. And that's generally the way new technologies become accepted. But to me, the interesting thing is, what can we do now that we couldn't do before? Mm. And I, I love this idea because it, it reminds me, actually, of a conversation we were having here on this stage yesterday about um, ancient Egypt and postmodern architecture. This, is, this has been quite a run we've had That's here, great. Yes. here at Lunchtime Live um, and thinking about the Memphis group and, and, and things like this. And, and one of the things that I found fascinating about, the Mem about, you know, about Memphis design um, is, is how willing they were to kind of throw out any sort of rule book or anything like this, and, and, and whether the design stand the test of time is you know, a matter for not your nor my generation to, to ascertain. But um, for you, what do you, do you think about the sort of future history of your pieces when you're designing them, or, or is it just what you want at this moment? It's a really interesting one. Uh, I, mean, I know of painters who are talking with conservationists about how their paintings can be sure to uh, endure. Um, I'm sufficiently confident in the technologies that we uh, develop uh, that they have huge potential for endurance. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I wouldn't feel comfortable using them. Sure. I think that's right. Well, it's, again, when you, you mentioned the arts and crafts movement and, and talk about painters talking to, to conservators, you know, about the future stuff, I'm reminded of the pre-Raphaelite artist William Holman Hunt, you mm -hmm. know, who's, who's uh, one of his most, uh, most famous works, The Awakening Conscience in Tate Britain. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but um, it, it has a custom-built frame designed by, um, by Hunt himself. Um, which um, actually opens up with a series of screws and bolts um, yeah. that, that, that I've seen removed. Uh, I've worked for Tate for many years. I've seen it a few times. And when you unscrew the screws from the front plate and, and kind of lower it, what you'll find in the upper left and right corners are pieces of text written in the margins of the painting by Hunt um, describing the specific pigments that he used yeah, right. Right. in order for future conservators to know what to do. So he actually yes, builds yes, into yes, his work, yes. like, this is how you will fix this in the future, which I love yes. the idea. Yes, <laughs> that yes, he he yes. understood he was, he was doing something that would be worthy of preservation. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it, That's quite something. Mm. In the future, which I, I always thought was a, 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 very, a very cool. I mean, again, it's, it, it, speaks, it speaks highly of his sense of self-worth, <laughs> I suppose, maybe. But, um, but, but I, I, love, I love that idea. Now, what, I mean... Now, you, you do primarily work with custom pieces for individual clients, um, yes. but you have uh, designed on a larger scale uh, for uh, organizations like Heels. Yes, um, some of the early things we did. I think it, it, I've only in a conversation this morning really come to me to recognize what's happened overall in terms of the pattern of one's life. Um, at the start of life, you don't know where you're going to get commissions from. <laughs> you know, you can't go knock on a door and say, I know. can I make a dining <laughs> table for you? Um, so the only people who have to buy are people who sell, the <laughs> retailers. Uh, and so we designed a range of products, um, some small woodware um, uh, and some low tables, mm -hmm. uh, which were largely machined, uh, minimal handwork, and uh, 12 screws and the whole table folded and contained a piece of glass within a crate which we could then ship off on the railway. So we did those in their 10s and 20s and up to 50 at a time and we got really bored doing it. Um, but then um, I met somebody who said, well, actually, that table could really go into production. And then it was made by the container load and sold through Habitat. So we moved down market, but the price halved and from being six pounds each uh, wholesale, they became three pounds each wholesale and had a huge market. That in turn led to a new phase, which was doing interiors, complete interiors, for things like universities and city companies, uh, which were 
um, where they were comfortable, they needed a boardroom and they needed it tote, complete, so one mm -hmm. was dealing with carpet and curtains and so on. And, and so that was another kind of bit of the market one could access. Gradually that led to the individual commissions where the furniture, what, what I sent to those interiors was I was almost always compromising on the furniture because the budget was never quite enough to do what I really wanted to sure. do. So then um, uh, I remember we did the interiors for a, a management college and it was the director of the management college who uh, was one of my first sort of clients for something really bespoke. And it evolved from there. Um, the person who'd funded the management college became a personal client, and we did lots of work for him. Uh, that were individual items. So it was a transition, really, from something which was saleable to somebody who had to buy, somebody who'd got a building where they needed an interior solution, to then heading towards getting, uh, making one-offs. Mm. And that's, that took, that probably took place over 30 years. Of course. Um, and this, I mean, over the course of a long career, you've made a lot of stuff. You've designed a lot of stuff. You've also handmade a lot of stuff. Um, and some of the objects uh, that you've made are, of course, here at, at Masterpiece um, uh, this year. How do, you, how do you feel when you see one of your works come up for, for auction or, or in the secondary market? Does it, does, it, does it affect you in any way? It certainly does, yes. Um, I particularly remember... Uh, uh, we made a pair, well, we were commissioned to make a pair of chairs by a, a, a British client, uh, and at the time we were still using exotic hardwoods. And um, his decision was, yes, we'd like it in Rosewood, make this pair of chairs. We were in the process of making the jigs to produce these chairs, and I realised that I'd underpriced this pair of chairs. I'd quoted him, I think, 15,000 for a pair of chairs. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I said, Peter, I've really got myself in a corner here. Would you mind if we made a second pair using the same jigs, uh, but in a different wood? And uh, interestingly, his response was, what wood? Would you think it's? And his next question was, can I have the, pair of cho the choice of which pair I have when you've made them both? Very smart. <laughs> oh, anyway, the other pair was made in holly. Mm -hmm. uh, just to complete that story, he made the choice and chose the rosewood. But somebody in the interim had come in and seen them in the workshop and said, look, if you could persuade your client to buy the rosewood, to have the holly pair, I'm prepared to pay 75,000 for the rosewood pair. Oh no. Oh no, <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, of course you, you, you know what happened, so he kept the rosewood pair. And I said, told him the story, he said, oh, that's easy. The holly pair are worth 100,000. <laughs> and I thought, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, then I had an invitation to exhibit in the States. And on the first day of an exhibition where they were there, two curators came up to me and said, may we buy that pair of chairs between us? that were Judy, they had Judy, bought them. One of them came on the market uh, and was auctioned more recently. And um, of course, I longed to know who'd bought it. Mm -hmm. Then a client from Italy um, sent me a photograph of her flat. And there it was. There it was. <laughs> um, just lovely. I mean, just a, a, a very interesting wave that um, you know, something of that calibre just moves through the market at a certain mm -hmm. level. Where uh, um, so, and, and yes, there have been times when auction houses have underperformed, times when they have excelled. Um, remember a pair of chairs which we'd made in Burr Myrtle. Um, beautiful, the whole route carved into a pair of chairs. Uh, bought by Mallets, sold to an American dealer. Um, he um, didn't look after them very well, sent them back to me to be repaired, and then I think he sold them for 60000 having paid 10000 for them in the first place. Mm. So it, it can go that way, it, it can go the other way. Of course, of course. And now, this is a slightly more esoteric question. Uh, do you think of your work as art? 
it doesn't really bother me, really. I don't mm. need to pigeonhole it. Um, I think that's for other people, probably. <laughs> that's for others to say. <laughs> no, why, why I ask is because when, when you were discussing um, the, the sort of total design of a space, um, including you know, fabrics, interiors, the full shebang, um, which you were doing earlier in your career, it reminded me of James McNeil Whistler, who <clears throat> spectacularly, in addition to being you know, uh, the greatest you know, American artist in British art history, is, mm -hmm. is, is also someone who, who had a rather uh, rough go of it during his time with decorating and, and design in the famous Peacock Room you know, in, in South Kensington. Uh, where he has these these knockdown drag out fights with 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 his patron over, um, oh, I mean I'm sure you know the story. I mean, you're all familiar with the stories, you know, of getting up to all sorts. I mean, he famously Whistler, while decorating the Peacock Room, uh, painted over a set of 16th century Cordoba leather wall coverings that were part of the dowry of Catherine of Aragon. You know, th th these are national treasures that he's yeah. he's being very cavalier, <laughs> with, right. you know, with yeah. um, and, and and famously with with his patron Leyland um, has a spectacular a spectacular falling out. And and why I ask this question is is not to be glib, but because um, Whistler regarded the full design of that space as, as being of a, a, a kind of a singular work of art yes, that, yes, that contained yes. multiple facets that, that unless everything was to his very specific specification, irrespective of history or value or the client or, or anyone yes. other than his yes. own vision, then the thing would be a failure. You know, and, and this is something that we tend to associate more with an artist vision than we do with a designer or a decorator yeah, yeah. or a furniture maker who we think of as, as working more collaboratively. Yes, I think that, that, that's very fair, um, a very fair observation. Uh, in a way, I'm tending to restrain myself to what I can control. Mm. Uh, and so in that sense, of, of course, one started in a period when commissioning something was almost unheard of. No, starting in, in the well, early 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, so the climate changes. Um, and I don't think at that time there was very much of that totality mm. happening, uh, whereas it would happen now. It does happen now. Oh, I think very much so. Um, mm -hmm. Now, your, your designs, as we say, are... are uh, well, I, I don't wish to, again, to pigeonhole, but um, are informed by modernism, they are in, informed by by the, the visual culture of, of of the 20th century. Do you do you have any particular terms that you like to think of yourself as working in? Do you think of yourself as an as an ist in any way, or a part of any ism? Not an ist, no. Um, <laughs> uh, but in fact, I find myself almost challenging modernism mm -hmm. in the sense that it was seeking to find a language for machines. Yes quite understandably at the time. And of course, many of the things that came out of that culture were handmade in order to look as if they were made, you know, could have been made by a machine. Mm. Um, why would I want to make something that has a machine aesthetic? You know, I think we've moved into a new era. Uh, I'm not, machines are useful, but they're simply a tool. Um, there are many tools we use and we don't seek to express them all. We're using digital methods. Um, we're not looking to express that specifically, but we are looking for a language mm. that, is, um, f that is new because the things have changed. So it's, it's <laughs> these are issues of um, trying to move f f forward in a way that takes technology, science, and, and imagination into new territory yeah. that fulfills its function better than could have been the case previously. Absolutely. What would, what would you, as a final question, then we'll actually open up the floor to any, um, any questions from the audience, uh, if you're okay with that. Um, sure. But my final question is this. What would you like to have done with furniture and design that you haven't had a chance to do yet? Well, I'm designing a house at the moment. Ooh, cool. Uh, 
Cool. <laughs> well, you, you have a history with, with, with design, architecture, homes, education, the whole, you know, I'm, do, I'm sure yes. as everyone knows. Right. Um, and uh, that's, that's a delight. Uh, it, it'll have quite a lot of furniture going into it, which we've made for the same clients over the years. Mm. Uh, Will you use anyone else's furniture? Is it all you? Um, not if I can help it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, there will there will be some antiques too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, no, these uh, these clients uh, saw in 2011 a pair of cabinets that we made um, using marquetry, uh, black and white marquetry, and it was we called there were zebra cabinets in marquetry. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, this last year, uh, we still had them. And um, the, a client's husband said, what would you like for your birthday? Can I have the zebra cabinets? So they will be going into this house. Um, and, and so, yes, I'm looking there at, uh, and working with architects, but thankfully architects who are hugely enthusiastic about the concept, mm -hmm. uh, which has been really caused rumpuses in, in the local planning office because it, it breaks all the sort of conventional planning officers rules, um, but now granted permission. And so two years, this next two years, is going to be very much involved in, in bringing that. So to now you have a, the, a, the freedom a, to create. And it, it almost reminds me of like the DeStyle group, you know, or like the Schroeder house or something. It's like, I love this idea of, of, John, of, of, of this, uh, this full three-dimensional cubic expression of yes. what it is that interests you. That's a, that's a very, very cool idea. I'll, I'll wait for the invitation when it's done. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, actually, if we could open up the floor, if anyone has any questions in the audience that they'd like to, uh, like to ask John. Oh, sorry, there's just a microphone coming your way. Sorry, just, just wait, just one, just one moment so everyone can capture you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your project with the V&A at the moment because it's really fascinating. So if you could tell us a bit about that, that would be great. Right. Yes, I seem to get involved in quite a lot of different <laughs> things. Uh, among them, um, we're just starting a 10-year program with the Victorian Albert Museum called Make Good rethinking material futures. And that, of course, reflects my interest in the future of trees and timber. Uh, and the fact that designers really have so little contact with wood uh, and their education becomes more and more remote from materials. Uh, and I somehow want to see young people being able to engage with materials that they you know, there's very strong conservation sense now among young people, but part of conservation to me is actually about looking after nature and making the very best of the trees we plant. And goodness, we talk about planting so many, uh, and they could just become firewood, which is what happens to most of our trees at the moment, especially our broadleaf trees. So, um, you know, part of our inheritance are those wonderful classic indigenous trees that I would want to see become part of future cultures mm -hmm. uh, because they're so special. <laughs> what, was it, what was it that informed your choice to use the scorching technique on your embrace and the chairs? I forget the name. Uh -huh. Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice one. Um, I'm very bored by oak that is various t shades of yellow to, to muddy brown. Um, it's fine when it's happened naturally, and I love it in medieval furniture or early furniture, uh, but my favorite things to do with oak are really to treat it hard. It's such a tough, enduring material that somehow we can express that either by bleaching it and getting the to the basic stuff of the timber rather than putting a, 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 a polish on it that goes yellow, but having that paleness and, and the tactile quality of wood, uh, which we, you know, we're normally separated from by, by the finish. Um, scorching is another way of showing that material to accentuate its qualities. So you've clearly been looking at some uh, seats in the exhibition where we've layered wood and penetrated through the layers, and you see this wonderful pattern of layers on top layer of wood where we've shaped it to take the body, um, because that, you know, 
a chair is so much about the body, and we rather few chairs seem to recognise that in a in a thorough way. Mm. Thank you. I couldn't agree with that more. Actually, there's so few chairs that one encounters. This this sounds very esoteric, but it's just an observation I, I have in my own life. There are so few chairs that know that they're chairs. If you see what I mean, <laughs> that it's something I've tried to impart to my students over the years. Is that yes. you should look for an object that understands fundamentally what it is. Yes. You know, um, and that I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I think it's thrilling actually when you think about furniture types. Um, when you think of chairs are really about our bodies and then tables are really about, to me, they're the, ta the floor raised up to whatever height we want it to be and how is it raised from the floor that's, you know, full of expression and then things where we store things which we value. So we buy things and we either think they're going to just go in the kitchen in a shelf or... Uh, they're going to go into a drawer or they're going to go into some other special cabinet where we, we treasure, where we put things that we treasure. Uh, and those are such different things in terms of our, our feelings. Mm. You know, in, a, in a chair, we pretty quickly know whether it, it's us or not or whether it's just something convenient to use the short term. But I love the, the idea that furniture can engage you. No, it's just not just something you use. It's something which is part of you and your and your values and your, you know, your heart and your soul. I couldn't agree more. The the, the sort of the the stage set the stage set of the theater of your life mm. is is mm. and particularly as you say in in the objects, John, that 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 we use to store the things that we really want. You know, mm. Mm. obviously we you know we we spend as much money as we can on a chair or a sofa or, 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 or whatever mm. it is, but. Um, the things that we, we really treasure, you know, we, we end up buying these pieces of wood or pieces of metal or plastic or MDF or whatever mm -hmm. to, to uh, store them, to mm -hmm. keep them safe, yes, to keep them, yes. keep them dry, you know, yes, yes. and those matter on some level, irrespective of cost. I mean, obviously you can spend a fantastic amount of money on any of this stuff if you so choose, but without spending necessarily an absolute fortune on, on, um, you know, on, on a John Makepeace original, you know, uh, that, that it still, it matters on some level, which is something that I, I think is, is absolutely imperative for people to understand, that, that the stage set of your life yes. does matter, mm. I think, mm. very much so. Mm. Uh, well, John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute Thank honor you. and a pleasure, and deeply informative. I look forward to one day being able to afford one of your pieces. <laughs> but in the, in the meantime, in the meantime, we can admire them here at Masterpiece. So thank you so much, and thank you everyone thank for you. joining us here at Lunchtime Live. Thank you. Thank you.